Good afternoon and early evening. Thank you so very much for joining us this evening for um, the Special Committee on Poverty Reduction and Prevention. We are so very happy to be here at Temple University Lewis Katz School of Medicine. Um, and we want to be gracious to our hosts. And we will have uh, Dean, JD, he said I can call him JD now, Dr. John Daly, who is the dean here at the medical school, give us welcoming remarks. And I want to thank the entire Temple team, including George Kenny and all the team who helped uh, put the logistics, helps put the logistics for us to be here this evening. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Chairwoman uh, Quiona Sanchez. We really appreciate your being here and choosing Temple to come. Uh, the members of the committee are also welcome, and we thank you for being here for this hearing. We appreciate uh, your leadership in passing Resolution 190-239, which established the Special Committee on Poverty Prevention and Reduction. We are the city's public university, and we're here to help offer some solutions as you move forward in your process. And we also look forward very much to working together to address poverty in the city of Philadelphia. It is one of the major issues that we face along with our care of patients and care of the people of the city of Philadelphia. Poverty is one of the major issues that impacts their care. So we're very grateful for your work in this area. We thank you for choosing to come here to the Lewis Katz School of Medicine today. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Maria Quinones Sanchez and I'm councilwoman in the 7th Councilmatic District. I have been uh, charged along with my colleague Councilman Alan Dom. Eva Gladstein, who chairs the Mayor's Cabinet on Health and Human Services, uh, and Charmaine Madlock-Turner, the CEO of the Urban Affairs Coalition, to chair what I like to call some of the best minds in the city of Philadelphia and stakeholders from the private and public sector, as well as uh, internal department heads and others to, in a few months, um, not to, to overthink this, but in a few months, really put forth uh, an aggressive uh, anti-poverty uh, strategy that could be embraced. And the way we've approached this is, is really um, simple, and then I'll introduce, uh, I'll let the members who are here introduce themselves and we'll get on with the panel. Um, the issue of poverty demands some urgency. If any day you look at the news and you see some of the violence, at the deep root of all of that is the generational poverty that has existed in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, many of us are frustrated with being highlighted as one of the, the largest um, cities with the highest number of poverty. This committee looks and has enlisted, as I mentioned, folks from all sectors to come together and put together what I like to, to call a process of how do we improve people's income, how do we improve their access to, to um, safety net and other programs, how do we increase their opportunities so that they can improve their quality of life with an aggressive goal that Council President Clark would say about how do we move 100,000 people out of poverty in the city of Philadelphia. If ma'am... You, you, you're an expert at this. You come to all of our hearings, um, and I really want you to join us and, and participate. But if you're going to be rude, then I'm going to ask you to leave. It's rude to have a subcommittee on poverty with no poor people on it. We have, as I mentioned earlier, we have a committee. So I, this is the last time I'm going to say it to you, because then if not, I'm going to have to, I'm going to ask you to leave. You're going to come here, you're going to testify, we're going to listen to you, and we're not going to be disrespectful to you. And so I'm going to ask you not to be disrespectful to others. So we have enlisted um, members from, from different stakeholders. Um, in fact, tomorrow I, we're hosting a focus group of people with lived experience, uh, particularly from the homeless community that the committee is doing. Every committee and subcommittee has been given all the freedom to not only uh, invite 
other other members into the committee, but create different processes. Uh, we had a hearing last week. We will have another one next week. There is a flyer available, and we have enlisted in the different types of focus groups. Tomorrow, I will be with again folks from the homeless. Um, sector participating in an in-depth conversation about uh, the 3,000 folks in homelessness that the city currently supports and the 5,000 that are in the street. So I will beg to differ on process. Um, that said, um, would members of the committee want to quickly introduce themselves? Mm -hmm. uh, Beth McConnell, Philadelphia Association of Community Development Corporations. Mo Rushdie. River Wards Group representing the um, Philadelphia Building Industry Association. Sue McFedrin from Mission First Housing Group. David Holloman, Chief of Staff for the City's Office of Homeless Services. Andy Frischkoff, the Director of Philadelphia LISC Local Initiatives Support Corporation. So in addition to the members here, and again, any other uh, subcommittee members that are in the audience who want to join us up here, we have representatives from the Philadelphia Housing Authority through its president and several of its key staff folks. We have the regional housing um, HUD director, Joe Felice, and a uh, member of his staff, Elvis Solomon, the Office of Homeless Services, as was mentioned, Liz Hirsch, and some of her team, the Office of Housing and Community Development, um, self uh, through Mike Hinson and Rashida, BIA, Bil Building Administri uh, Industry Association, the Pennsylvania Association of CDCs, the Pes Pennsylvania Apartment Association, list as was introduced, ASIC, Com Compass Working Capital, Little Giant Creative, um, Rebuilding Together, Habitat for Humanity, Women's Community Vitalization, ACT UP, Neighborhoods Gardens Trust, APM, SABA, Mission First, the Reinvestment Fund, and uh, Community Legal Services. So with that, uh, if there are no comments from any of the members of the committee, I am going to ask our first panel to come forward. Uh, that would be Marquita Morris-Lewis from Camp Campus uh, working Capital, Harry Tapia from ASE, and Stephanie Selden from Rebuilding Together. Good afternoon, members of speak council. Closer to the microphone. Oh, absolutely. Good afternoon, good evening, members of council, guests, uh, members of the Special Committee on Poverty Reduction and Housing Subcommittee. My name is Marquita Morris louis I'm Chief Strategy Officer of Compass Working Capital. I'm honored to offer you an example of a rental equity program model that be, could be employed here in our city. Compass Working Capital is a nonprofit financial services organization whose mission is to support families with low incomes to build assets as a pathway out of poverty and toward financial stability. At Compass, we know that assets are a stronger predictor of financial stability than income, um, and yet our country has historically measured and addressed poverty solely in terms of income. In fact, our nation's anti-poverty programs generally discourage families from or penalize them for building assets needed to invest in their future. These penalties intersect with historic and persistent structural barriers that are core to the racial and gender wealth gaps of which we're all too familiar. Compass's long-term vision is to end asset poverty for 2.2 million families by integrating asset building strategies into our nation's social safety net and public assistance systems, beginning with families living in federally subsidized housing. For nearly the last 10 years, Compass has focused its efforts on developing and expanding an asset building model for the Department of Housing and Urban Development's Family Self-Sufficiency Program, or FSS. FSS is a promising but underutilized employment and savings program, and its power is rooted in its ability to integrate asset building into the delivery of federal housing assistance. So family who receives housing assistance generally pay 30% of their income toward rent. Although designed to keep housing affordable, this structure also discourages families from increasing their income as they were about paying more rent at the same time as they're losing other benefits tied to income. The rent calculation for families in subsidized housing effectively functions as a marginal tax or increased earnings, an effect which also makes it difficult for households to build savings. Families often share the sentiment that they are getting by, but they feel trapped, and instead they want to get ahead. So the FSS program removes this dense incentive by allowing families who increase their earned income to capture the corresponding rent increase into an escrow account. 
This savings account is held by the housing provider. It bills over time, and families can use this savings to achieve their financial goals. There is no other anti-poverty program like FSS in the country, one that integrates asset building into the provision of housing or public assistance. No one other. In 2010, Compass became the first nonprofit in the country to launch an asset building model for the FSS program, partnering with public housing authorities and other agencies to execute on our model that combines the program's powerful savings account with high quality financial coaching and other asset building strategies to drive financial outcomes for the participants. The Compass model also incorporates effective program management practices to increase program participation enrollment and graduation rates generally. National enrollment rates hover around 3%, while at Compass we achieve enrollment three to four times the national average and have 90% of our graduates um, graduate with savings as compared to 47% nationally. In fact, just last year our program graduates saved an average of $8,400 and used their savings to meet a variety of financial goals including purchasing homes, paying down debt, establishing and growing emergency savings funds, and funding their educations or the educations of their children. Just over 40% of our graduates purchase homes or make a positive ac exit for housing if it is their choice to do so. On average, our graduates decrease their debt by $2,100 and increase their credit scores by 69 points. An interim cost-benefit analysis of our programs found that participants gained more than $10,000 in increased incomes over a five-year period as a result of participation in the program at a net cost to the government of only $276 per participant. We currently operate our FSS model across nine sites in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, serving nearly 2,000 families a year. We've enjoyed a partnership with the Philadelphia Housing Authority since 2018, and through that collaboration are seeking to grow the program to be one of the top five nationally in terms of enrollment. We also see significant opportunity in partnering with multifamily owners, both for-profit and nonprofit developers of affordable housing. When the program was first created in the 90s, Congress inexplicably limited participation to families living in public housing or receiving housing choice or Section 8 vouchers. But in 2018, Congress passed comprehensive FSS legislation that permanently authorized multifamily owners with units subsidized by project-based rental assistance to operate the FSS program. Though the participant escrow accounts are funded by HUD and available without cap, the service coordinator dollars, the dollars that are used to fund the roles that provide direct service to the families that participate, like financial coaching, are available through a competitive process, but only to housing authorities, not to multifamily owners. So we've been successful in attracting philanthropy to support the growth and expansion of our FSS programs and our partnerships with Philadelphia and Boston housing authorities. And we believe additional sources of funding are necessary to incentivize more multifamily owners to set up and operate FSS programs as well. Compass is the first organization to operate multifamily-based FSS programs since the enactment of the authorizing legislation, and we're interested in bringing this model on the multifamily side to Philadelphia. Council could play a significant role in expanding this valuable resource by providing critical funding to support the outreach, program management, and financial compo coaching components of the FSS program in the multifamily space. Philly has a robust and sophisticated affordable housing community consisting of some of the largest for-profit developers and some of the most high-performing, high-capacity, mission-aligned nonprofit developers. All affordable housing developers will tell you that they operate with tight margins. Whether you believe that or not, what we do know is that the FSS program will not grow in the multifamily market without additional investment at the local level. Council created a fund that allows multifamily owners to access dollars to support tenants and residents in the creation and operation of FSS programs. These dollars paired with HUD's contribution through the escrow could create opportunities for families to convert their rent into an asset. The program is certainly worthy of Council's continued exploration and ultimately its investment. And I'd be happy to share additional information should you choose to inquire. Thank you. Marquita, since you have to go, I'm, I want to quickly open it up to any questions from, from the panel. Um, Andy, Andy Frisch. Uh, Thank you. Um, so uh, LISC is also uh, trying to do more in support of preserving uh, at-risk uh, federally subsidized rental housing. I'm, I'm just curious, have you uh, had a particular engagement with any <coughs> owners where you think that the, there's a strong interest there in Philadelphia but for the coordinating uh, dollars? Absolutely. Um, we're actually having conversations with two owners that have pretty large portfolios nationally and have a significant presence in Philadelphia. 
Um, the initial two are both for-profit. We would love to talk to some nonprofit owners who are interested in Mission Align. We've been able to bring some ph philanthropy to the table to at least test out um, this program and to um, in provide initial seed funding to, to get them launched. But we are advocating at the federal level and also identifying additional payers to support this work so that it's sustainable in the long term. And then just one other question, if I could. On the financial coaching, um, is there a particular model that you've uh, adopted and particular coaches that you're working with in the Philadelphia area? Yeah, in Philadelphia, we actually partner with Clarify, which is a well-known quantity. I've, I've spent nearly seven years as senior vice president, general counsel at Clarify, so I absolutely vouch for the quality of the services and the reputation um, as a HUD uh, uh, HUD certified housing counseling agency and also a, a strong financial coaching agency. Our model is really about being client-centered, acknowledging and, and, and understanding and having a firm belief in the power and the creativity and ingenuity of the families that we serve, that they are the best authors of their own lives. So we coach and our model is based purely in that model of client-centered, client-driven um, goal setting. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Can you <clears throat> quickly describe what your portable benefit looks like? How is that money managed? I'm assuming folks can take it anywhere. At, how do you manage that? At graduation. So graduation means families initially have to set goals, and graduation means achieving those goals and being free from cash assistance for 12 months. Those are the kind of core um, standards for graduation. And once families um, achieve graduation, they make a request for a disbursement of the escrow, and that money is theirs. So, you know, just to give you a sense of scale, we've seen we've seen households exit the program with thirty five thousand dollars, and that's because they've made a significant increase in their earned income and allowed that to uh, accumulate over five years. Um, but yeah, the families. You know, they, they can get it. And we track how families use the escrow um, once they exit. Some folks use it for a down payment on a, on a house. Um, we have some of, uh, Marco, who's here from PHA, who could talk a lot about that. And they, they take advantage of PHA's terrific home ownership programs and use that escrow in conjunction with other grants available through PHA, through the Federal Home Loan Bank System. And then pile them on, and they, are, they have equity the moment they set foot in the door, significant equity in their homes in that case. So give me the timeline, people entering, going out. Mm -hmm. What's that timeline look like? It's typically five years, um, but if, if families achieve their goals sooner, they can graduate sooner. Um, the maximum is seven years, and they allow an extension in kind of six-month in increments if they hit a roadblock or, or, you know, just need a little additional time to achieve their goals. But... The, the general program lift is five years. When you do the private market one, what is it that you require from the private market? What's the ask? Or pub Yeah. Mm -hmm. The big ask is, so primary is mission alignment, right? Like we want folks who do this because they're committed to seeing their residents do well and, and, and achieve their goals and, and get on a road towards economic stability. Um, but they, And they also have to commit some financial skin in the game, right? It's not... Unfortunately, there are no dollars available at the federal level for the multifamily providers to support the, the program costs, right? So they have to be willing to come out of pocket. But like I mentioned, so many say that their margins are tight. They need a little bit of a nudge and incentive, some support to come out of pocket. So something that met them halfway. If the program costs $100,000 to run, let them put in 50 and be able to com com compete for another 50 to support this work over time. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Beth? Mm -hmm. Let me recognize Councilman Alan Dahm has joined us. I'm sorry if I missed in your testimony, but did you say or do you know how many people do you have in Philadelphia in the program at any given time? How much does it cost? And so if we were to scale it up, how what what the dollar amount would be? Yeah, so um, with, the, with the program we have with the Philly Housing Authority, we are about 700 enrolled now. Um, and that's, we've been partnered with the Philly Housing Authority since about 2018, and we've nearly doubled enrollment since the time that we um, partnered with Philly Housing. On the multifamily side, we haven't started any, launching any programs on the multifamily side in Philadelphia. Um, but in terms of cost, we're actually working on cost per serve and getting that down. Right now, it's about $1,200. Um, but you're seeing, we see enormous returns in terms of increase in income for families and then the, then the asset account that they graduate with. But we're working on a remote service model on the multifamily side to be able to bring those costs down. So 1200 per year per participant? Per participant, correct. Okay. 
Any other questions? Interest earned? Yes. Um, it's, 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 it's earned in one account, so the provider is not required to um, segregate the accounts. All the accounts are held in, in, one, um, in one vehicle, and the interest is allocated across the households based on the, the amount of the escrow. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. Excuse me, my voice, my voice is kind of going, but I see in your testimony that the cost was two hundred and seventy-six dollars per participant. That is, that is, so the all-in net benefit mm -hmm. associated when you add in the the cost of the program, the the um, earnings of the families over time, and the escrow, the net is two hundred seventy-six dollars. Okay. Once you, in in terms of the amount that is output and what's brought back by the families increasing their income and building this asset. Okay. Yeah. So that's different than the twelve hundred right. you're talking right. about. Correct. Okay. That that twelve hundred doesn't account for all the benefits yeah. that accrue as a result. Thank you okay. for asking that clarified question. Okay. No other questions? Thank you so much. I know you are on a time deadline, so I wanted to get you in and Thank out. Thank you. I really appreciate it. No problem. So we will move to Harry Thapia from ASA and Stephanie Selden from Rebuilding and we'll wait for questions. Um, after that. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for having me uh, today. Uh, as Maria mentioned, my name is Harry Tapia. I'm the Director of Operations for HASE. Uh, HASE is a CDC that's located in the Fairhill and San Hugh neighborhood of Philadelphia. We've been operating and developing low-income and senior housing uh, for the past 38 years in, uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, one of the things that we are really uh, looking forward to and um, trying to figure out is how can we make the 4% tax credit uh, vehicle work for us as we have expiring um, old, uh, you know, affordable housing that is already reaching that 30-year, you know, affordability period. Um, I know that there is a vehicle right now uh, through uh, the uh, Housing Trust Fund so that we can get some of the money in order to you know, sort of make our gap works. Uh, right now, there's a $2 million cap, uh, which is very similar to the 9%. Uh, and again, we feel that because a 4% is not competitive and it's kind of harder to do, it would be perfect if we can get, get that cap increase for the 4% tax credits in order for us to be able to actually make more deals work at the 4% tax credits. Currently, uh, we have completed one in our neighborhood. Lehigh Park Apartments is 74 units. However, it needed to really be heavily subsidized, so meaning that all of our units needed to either be Section 8 or RAD uh, uh, funded or subsidized in order for us to make that deal work, um, which was great for that deal. However, um, ideally, we wouldn't want all of our units to be that heavily subsidized. So, you know, increasing the cap on the 4% from two to three will really help us out on smaller deals that we want to uh, either get off the ground or resyndicate some of the units that we currently have. Um, another function that we really want to focus in is really home ownership. Um, and uh, we really would like to have uh, maybe some subsidies that could be uh, directed into home ownership. Right now there isn't any vehicle uh, for that. We are currently working on a land trust program uh, at Hase, um, yeah, so any of you know, we were in the competition with the Philadelphia Foundation, and we won first place in order to develop that. So we are currently working uh, with uh, foundations to see how we can actually get that funded. So if there is any uh, subsidies that would be able to go towards our units, you know, it would help us actually get those units off the ground. And then in addition, uh, you know, we would like to, for some of them to be rent to own. So if we were able to have some long-term shallow subsidies to get those residents from renters to owners uh, through that vehicle, we would really appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> just want to acknowledge, Charmaine, I don't know if you want to join us up here. I said earlier, <laughs> uh, on one of our co-chairs, Charmaine Matlock-Turner, uh, President and CEO of the Urban Affairs Coalition. Thank you for joining us. <coughs> Perfect. Um, do you have anything else you wanted to add? No. no. Okay. No, no, no. We'll take Stephanie and then we'll... I have a visual aid in the one that brings him up and maybe you can pass him around and share. Uh, when she's finished... Okay. I just wanted to be talking about the... 
Oh, wait. Well, um, we're asking people to testify, so we're happy to put you on the list so that you can come testify. Okay, but I don't. I mean, I don't want to interrupt. That's why I'm asking mm -hmm. the questions to be asked. Okay. You're gonna have questions to people and the panelists. Cause yeah, and yeah, yeah. We. Okay. I got questions. We're not really formatted that way in this session, unlike the first session where there was some. But um, uh, I'll get to you in a minute. Let me I, figure, figure, we'll figure something out. I understand. I understand. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, council members, Dom and Quinona Sanchez, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Since 1988, Rebuilding Together Philadelphia has revitalized communities by transforming vulnerable owner-occupied houses into safe, healthy, and energy efficient homes. Every year, Rebuilding Together repairs 100 to 125 homes with about 1,000 volunteers. As you all know, Philadelphia is a city of homeowners. We have a 51% homeownership rate citywide. Many of these homeowners are living on a fixed or low income and are unable to afford to maintain their homes in safe conditions. A census study has shown that houses with roof leaks and other repair issues are much more likely to be abandoned. To prevent homelessness and poverty, we need to keep homeowners in their homes. To reduce poverty, we need to preserve a family's greatest asset. That asset, a safe and healthy home, is the leg up that families need to move out of poverty. The need is vast. The city's 2018 Housing Action Plan reported that 27,000 housing units in the city are without complete plumbing or kitchen facilities. Our neighbors are living without ovens, without showers, without toilets. I outline many other policy reasons why home repair is critical to poverty reduction, including improving health and safety, promoting equitable development, preserving the environment, and being cost effective, um, but I won't, won't read all of those to save time and allow other witnesses to testify, but they're in my written remarks. Um, to its credit, the city has invested millions of dollars to preserve home ownership. Multiple organizations have worked for years to provide home repairs to needy households who faced a host, who faced a host of housing challenges, including, including housing insecurity, health and safety problems, and high energy costs. Now is the time for home repair providers to come together to ensure that resources are invested wisely, collaboratively, and comprehensively. I've included a picture of a home repaired by the city's basic system repair program. This is a photo of a house after repairs were done. For those of you who don't have my testimony, um, it is a ceiling in great disrepair. Um, it is underneath the roof that was fixed to the homeowner's satisfaction. But as you can see, the ceiling, for those of you who can't see, the ceiling is in really, really rough shape. Um, in fact, this is a home that Rebuilding Together Philadelphia is repairing now. While this is a home, with, while this home was first repaired by the basic system repair program, other home repair providers including RTP, unfortunately leave homes with repairs that are undone due to budget constraints. The attached health and housing toolkit, which we were charged to create by this subcommittee, offers a way to ensure homeowners receive all the repairs they need the first time. It provides for housing repair agencies to leverage resources not just from the city, but also from private funders that support nonprofits such as RTP, Habitat for Humanity Philadelphia, the Energy Coordinating Agency, and the Philadelphia Corporation for, Agents, Corporation for Aging. All of my colleagues were supportive of this toolkit. In addition, PEA, Philadelphia LISC, and PACDC also contributed. Um, so my thanks to all of those agencies for their support of this roadmap. Um, I'm going to just summarize the toolkit briefly. First, we need to create a list of home standards 
that qualifies a home as healthy, safe, and energy efficient. Then we need to require all home repair providers utilizing city support, city support to conduct a universal home evaluation based on those home standards. There should be a set maximum amount of money provided to fix all the hazards identified by the universal home evaluation. Further, homeowners should be able to seek repairs during after work hours and at neighborhood locations. And all of those multiple points of entry for applicants need to be consolidated and coordinated by a single agency. This home repair connection system should allow application information to be shared and would allow for the creation of a system that connects providers of only some repairs to providers of other needed repairs. Applicants should be screened for housing affordability assistance such as homestead exemption, utility programs, and the city's home repair loan program, as well as tangled title issues. Homeowners also need free legal services for estate planning to prevent tangled title in the future. Finally, after repairs are complete, providers must report the repairs fixed and the remaining numbers of hazards still in the home so we can have a scorecard of how the system is working and make changes if it's not. I want to conclude with the words of a homeowner, Ruby Beckett from Mantua, whom we <coughs> assisted. She grew up in Philadelphia, lived in her home for 35 years. She <coughs> needed a roof and couldn't afford to repair it. She took out a loan and had a contractor try and fix our roof, but the roof was <coughs> completed in a subpar manner. Water damage eventually caused holes in room after room of her house. After RTP fixed her home, she wrote, my neighbors in Mantua and I are grateful to Rebuilding Together Philadelphia for our repairs, but we have many friends and neighbors who are living in unsafe houses. I want other Philadelphians to receive the help they need to repair their homes. Together, let's make Miss Beckett's wish for our neighbors come true. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Any questions from any of the panel members? Mm -hmm. Just a quick question, Harry. Can you say your name for the record? Because we're getting a, we have the stenographer. Sorry. Um. Beth McConnell, Philadelphia Association of CDCs. Harry, your specific recommendation was to lift the cap, the $2 million cap on 4% uh, low income housing tax credits. Can you just say briefly whose cap is that? What cap is that? What power control do we have in the city of Philadelphia to lift that yeah. cap? So the cap is from the city of Philadelphia, right? And they have it for both the 9% tax credit and the 4% tax credits. But again, as I mentioned, the 9%, they're so competitive and um, hard to get. If we were able to have additional money set aside for 4% deals specifically, we'll be able to get more off the ground. And do you have a sense of, like, um, does the cap need to go up to $3 million, $4 million, $5 million? How We would love for it to go up to $3 million, um, but, I mean, if... You know, if I had it my way, it would be up to $5 million so that we could really <laughs> uh, make the 4% tax uh, deals work. Uh, but, you know, uh, just an initial from 2 to 3 would really uh, help us sort of, you know, close our gap to make those deals work. Yeah, and um, before Andy takes it, I know that Liz has been working really hard around this preservation. And in the conversations, part of what we've been talking about is, how do we get to some groups before the their time period is up, right, and get them some incentives and get multiple enrollments? So let's say you're in year, I guess you have, if you have a 15-year deal, if you're in year 12, right, yeah. and we say we're going to give you a couple million dollars, would you sign up for another 30, you know, is that doable? Can we have that conversation? So rather than just in a, addition to a potential buying of these buildings, but you know the willingness of, of both from the private and public uh, low-income tax credit folks willing to sign up. Yeah, and that's usually what we do. It's always resyndicated and extended out for another 30 years, so it's very doable from. So if we ask you for more, though, more commitment, right? Yeah. Some of these, for the CDCs, you created a market, right? So some of the value on this stuff. So. Yeah, I, of course. So we keep our stuff uh, into perpetuity. So. 
um, having to even extend it another five or 10 years from the initial 30 would not be a problem for us. Okay. Oh, yeah. Andy Frischkoff? Uh, yeah, Andy Frischkoff, Philadelphia Lisk. Um, so you mentioned your 4% project and without having to go into details, but so because there was a $2 million cap, how many funding sources did you end up having to come up with? You mentioned you had a lot of subsidies, and generally, what was the total gap that you needed to, to that cover? We needed to, so, for a Lehigh Park apartment uh, project, which was at four percent, we essentially had to make the entire building, you know, sort of Section Eight, which is not really how we like to build our communities, right? We like to have it mixed income so that we have some that are subsidized, but some that aren't so heavily subsidized. So we had to put together, it was six different funding sources, um, and uh, we had to get an extension of uh, all the Section 8 um, contracts for another 20 years, and sometimes HUD does not like to do that. So, um, yeah. So it was, yeah, a lot of different forces, uh, sources in order to make a 4% tax bill uh, work. Stephanie, real quick, Councilman Dom and I were, were asking, um, as you read your quote, um, and I don't know if you are aware, what is the waiting list right now in basic systems? I don't have the answer okay. to that. I, I would. I, like I was to telling know. you, I think we're working through the list pretty rapidly. I think it's, it's the good, issue yeah. of the coordination piece around the multiple uh, pieces that was more challenging. Although I will note that the waiting list was closed while they were working through the backlog. So because of that, even though there's not an official wait list, there are many, many more people waiting than we than have had the opportunity to apply. Yeah, that has also come up in our discussion about how do we open that up again to gauge, right? Right. Because, and, and um, as I was explaining to Councilman Dom, when council approved the $60 million as part of the $100 million preservation, um, we were getting through the list and there was a backlog, so... Um, okay. Any other questions? Question? Yeah. Uh, Councilman Dahl. Yeah, thank you. I just had a question. You know, I'm looking at your testimony, and thank you to all of you for your testimony, and thank you, everybody, for being here. 11000 for do basic repairs versus 434, 434000 for a new property. But of the 434, how much of that is city funds versus maybe state or federal? So that's a great question that I can't answer because we don't build new affordable housing. I don't know, and I don't want to pass this on to Harry, but if uh, for a new unit of affordable housing, when you do that, how much is city? Um, it, I don't know. It de it, I guess it depends on the deal. Yeah. Sue. <laughs> Sue McFedrin from Mission First Housing Group. I would say that the city's money varies anywhere from maybe 30, 25 or 30 to $50,000, um, depending on the project. Per unit. Per yeah. unit. So then instead of looking at this initially and saying, wow, we can fix 40 homes for every one we repair, I'm sorry, we can repair 40 homes for every new one we build, that number is really closer to four or five because we're getting contributions from federal and state, I guess. Right, but I also, you know, would not want to leave the subcommittee with the impression that we don't need to build new affordable housing. No, no, it, well, it's yeah. definitely more affordable to preserve existing homes, but it doesn't. But the, add I guess more. what I'm saying is, when you look at the numbers, the impact. If someone's just reading your testimony, they Correct. would say, "Hey, wait a second, eleven thousand to repair, four thirty-four, but it's really from the city's perspective somewhere between thirty to fifty thousand of our money." versus 11,000 because we're getting monies from federal and state. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you folks um, so very much. We're gonna move to a second panel. We have Karen Warrington, Michael Froelich from Community Legal Services, and Ibani Taggart from the Women's Community Re Revitalization Project. Just so that people are in the queue, after that I have Jamal Henderson from ACT UP, Carrie Rothman from Habitat for Humanity, and Jenny Greenberg from the Neighborhoods Trust. Karen, I think you were listed first, but whichever order. Mm -hmm. okay. I 
Ebony. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Ebony Taggart, and I'm an organizer with the Women's Community Revitalization Project. We are part of a citywide 65-member Philadelphia Coalition for Affordable Communities with members from community, union, faith-based, disability, and urban agriculture organizations. Our coalition formed more than five years ago because we saw the early signs of gentrification and displacement and knew that without low-income rental housing, families would not be lifted out of poverty. I'm here today on behalf of renters who make up about 50% of the city's population. You are hearing from me because due to transportation costs, childcare challenges, and alternative work schedules, this meeting is not accessible to many individuals that would like to be here today. In the last decade, housing costs have, as you know, housing costs have skyrocketed, leading many to be house cost burdened, meaning they spend too much of their earnings on housing, leaving less money for medication, transportation, and more. We need the city to do more to preserve and create low-income rental housing. For WCRP, the need for low-income rental housing has been clear for the last 30 years. We house nearly 300 families in our developments. More than 70% work full-time but do not earn enough money to purchase a home when they come to us. Many earn an eight to $12,000 per year. In Philadelphia, you need to earn 50% of the area median income to earn to, um, excuse me, you need to earn 50% of area median income or earn at least $41,000 per year to purchase a home. Median household income in Philadelphia is less than $40,000, and the cost of housing is steadily going up. In North Philadelphia alone, median residential sales prices increased 363, um, excuse me, 363% from the year 2000 to the year 2016. Several weeks ago, WCRP opened up applications for our new 35-unit development in Germantown. We had 700 applicants for 35 low-income units, 700 for 35 units. And so for context, Germantown is an area that most people consider affordable still. Our organization also offers supportive services to our families and as a result has in-depth knowledge about their personal circumstances. What I can share is that many of our tenants have gone on to become homeowners after many years of having stable, low-income rental housing, they experienced less stress while raising their families, developed job skills, entered careers, and were able to make more money. If you own a home, I want you to take a second to remember when you were a renter, because most of us were at some point. It was having that affordable option that laid the foundation for you to own a home today, maybe among and many other things. Our coalition has grown 75% since its inception because all over the city, people are feeling the pinch of the quickly evaporating low-income housing stock. Here are some examples of why organizations from all over have partnered with us to preserve and create low-income rental housing. One of our coalition members advocates for low-income rental housing because they work with battered women who are afraid to leave their abuser because they don't earn enough money to live on their own. Another, another one of our coalition partners joined us because employees in their union are required to live in city limits, which is becoming increasingly challenging due to being outpriced by higher earning newcomers. Another coalition partner stands with us because they work with the disability community, who makes up almost 20% of the city's population, the majority living on a fixed income, making home ownership nearly impossible. We acknowledge that the city has taken action around housing in the last four years. However, many of the benefits of the programs implemented have weighted towards homeowners. And for the record, we support home ownership programs. However, we are here to lift up the plight of the 50% of city residents who at any given time are not in the position to purchase a home. Furthermore, with the reputation as the poorest city in America, one of them, who can really afford to buy all these homes? We are asking that when the 10-year tax abatement is reformed, that the money coming back to the city is used to fund programs that preserve and create low-income rental housing. We also want council to focus on supporting permanent affordability through tools like the Community Land Trust. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my, uh, members of the committee. My name is Michael Froelich, and I'm the managing attorney of the Home Ownership and Consumer Rights Unit 
at Community Legal Services. I work in our North Philadelphia office, uh, which has been at Broad and Erie for about 45 years, um, just, just two blocks or three blocks north of here. Uh, the Homeownership and Consumer Rights Unit at Community Legal Services tries very hard to help our low-income homeowner clients save their homes because we know that the most affordable housing that they will ever have is very likely the home in which they now live. Uh, there are many aspects to how to increase and preserve home ownership among low-income Philadelphians and how home ownership is directly related to reducing and preventing poverty. But I want to spend my limited time uh, today talking about Community Legal Services' agenda to preserve the Philadelphia family home. Because once a family achieves home ownership, we want to ensure that they can keep it and at some point that it will pass to their children. Intergenerational family homes are one way that low-income families can protect against rising property values in some parts of the city and avoid involuntarily, involuntary displacement. And it is one of the strongest ways that families of color in particular build wealth in our country. Nationally, the median black household is estimated to have only one-twelfth of the wealth of the median white household, and two-thirds of household wealth is tied up in a home's equity. Philadelphia has historically been a city where the American dream of home ownership has been open to families both rich and poor. About a third of homeowners in Philadelphia have annual incomes at or below $35,000 a year. But unfortunately, home ownership rates in Philadelphia have recently been on the decline. According to Pew's Philadelphia Research Initiative, between 2006 and 2017, the city's home ownership rate dropped from 60% to 48%. And while it's important to help families purchase homes, it is equally important to help current homeowners save their homes. And at CLS, we understand that the intergenerational Philadelphia family home is under attack. We hear these stories from our clients every day. There are several things that the city can do to acknowledge and address these attacks, uh, very doable things. I've included um, nine suggestions in my written material, um, and I'll just highlight a few uh, now. Um, in no particular order, uh, the number one, the high cost of probate fees makes it very difficult for many families to raise their loved one's estates. Uh, for our clients, for example, cost to probate an estate in Philadelphia is about $450. And $450 may not sound a lot, like a lot to some people, but after a family has gone through and raised money to give their loved one a proper burial, it is oftentimes unaffordable for many and will result in the estate simply going unaddressed and the record ownership of the home remains in the deceased family's member's name for years or decades. Uh, number two, uh, many homeowners in Philadelphia have federally insured mortgages. Sometimes we refer to them as FHA insured mortgages. And when they fall behind in their mortgage, they frequently also fall behind in their gas and water bills. Now, the good news is because it's an FHA-insured mortgage, these homeowners, if they obtain new uh, income, they can be, uh, qualify for mortgage modifications that allow them to catch up and remain in their home. The bad news is that there are federal rules governing these mortgages that require that a loan modification have first lien position. And I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but uh, municipal liens like gas and water uh, liens um, no matter when they're incurred, are considered to be super priority. And many mortgage servicers denied mortgage notification. So as a result, if a homeownership on, with an FHA-insured mortgage has a water or gas lien, it is virtually impossible for them to qualify for a modification and avoid a mortgage foreclosure sheriff sale. The city could help resolve this by adopting a policy to subordinate municipal liens like water liens and gas liens if the homeowner otherwise qualifies for a permanent mortgage modification and the homeowner is enrolled and current in the TAP or CRP assistance program. This simple step would allow families to qualify for loan modifications and save their homes from sheriff sales. Uh, number three, uh, predatory reverse mortgage lenders continue to deceive our elderly homeowners and convince them to borrow money on their homes with the promise that their children will be able to work something out once, uh, once the, the homeowner dies. And unfortunately, the only option for heirs whose parents took out often unnecessary reverse mortgages to save their family home is to qualify for a new mortgage. Uh, more community education about both the benefits and the consequences of reverse mortgages is necessary, and deceptive reverse mortgage originators ought to be held accountable. 
Um, I'm going to stop there. Like I said, there's nine uh, t uh, recommendations in total. And I'd be happy to take questions about additional um, uh, recommendations. Community Legal Services uh, certainly supports um, uh, all of the uh, testimony that, uh, that Ebony testified about um, um, uh, renters uh, in the city, but thought I wanted to spend some time today talking about homeowners because preserving the Philadelphia family home is critical to help low-income homeowners and ease the intergenerational passage of these homes. Um, it's a key part of reducing and preventing poverty, and we look forward to continue to work with City Council on these issues. Thank you. I'm going to let Karen, and then we'll ask questions. Of course, of course. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Warrington, and I appreciate the invitation to testify before the City Council Housing Subcommittee on Poverty Reduction and Prevention. And I appreciate the invitation that was extended to me by Mr. Tay Smith. I was born here at Temple University Hospital. My understanding is that at the time, few blacks were born here. Minutes after my birth, my father was excitedly looking at his newborn daughter in the nursery when a white new father glanced at me and said, oh, look, there's a piccaninny. So just minutes old, I was identified by the way of an offensive racial epithet. And throughout my lifetime, I have witnessed how race, being black in America, affects every aspect of black family life. My family bought a home in North Philadelphia in the 1920s. It was a neighborhood of aspirational and middle class black families. We had black doctors, dentists, nurses, teachers, and attorneys who lived in the immediate neighborhood. When I was five, my mother enrolled me in the then Logan Demonstration Elementary School, which was the masterman of the day. She deliberately bypassed the neighborhood schools located within blocks of my home. Even in the 1940s and 50s, many black parents knew that their neighborhood schools were not up to par. Gradually, our neighborhood declined, and so did city services. Slum lords cut up multi-story houses, and businesses were shuttered. And I remember my grandmother saying, Temple is going to take all these properties. I also remember my family's search for homeowner's insurance, <coughs> because insurance companies did not want to write policies in our community. And banks redlined the area, preventing blacks from securing mortgages. And what I have recently discovered is that black men returning from the military in the 40s, such as my father, were denied the GI Bill to purchase homes or attend college. Consequently, young families chose to move to neighborhoods then opening up to black home ownership because of the federal fair housing laws. These families mostly moved to Germantown, Mount Airy, and Eastwick. Accompanying the decline of North Philadelphia, the major media constantly referred to the area as a ghetto, and later parts of North Philadelphia were declared as the Badlands. For me, I was witnessing not only the wholesale displacement of black families, but quality education was further and further from the reach of black families who were not politically connected or couldn't afford private school. And public schools in North Philadelphia and throughout most of the black community were on life support. Not only were black families in search of decent housing, they were in search of quality education. City government's response was more public housing and continuing non-functioning public school education and city recreation department services. So today, I see the direct correlation between a failing public school system, racially segregated hand-me-down neighborhoods, and little or no sustainable wage employment. Black families, no matter where they live, tried to get their children into the handful of so-called good schools, but were restricted to the failing schools in their neighborhoods. I call it educational apartheid. Today, the ravages of this level of Philadelphia's race-based societal neglect reveals itself in the numbers of black men in prison, unemployed black men standing on corners while white men in trucks with Jersey licenses work on construction sites in their neighborhoods, and black men being released from prison saying they learned to read while they were incarcerated. It amazes me how the American public education system in basically one generation was able to lift up largely poor, non-English speaking immigrants and help them on the path to higher education and professional careers. 
Today, access to quality education and safe, stable, affordable housing continue to be beyond the reach of too many black families. Too many black people will find low paying jobs as CNAs, security guards, or working at McDonald's if they find employment at all. And that is because this city, its government, academics, philanthropic foundations, and the business and the corporate communities have turned their back on the educational and housing needs of the black community. The recent debacle at Penn Franklin High School, which was once Central High until the color of the population changed, is now the site of Ben Franklin with majority black and Puerto Rican students and the Science Leadership Academy with mostly white students whose parents refer to themselves as privileged. This has become a have and have not separate and unequal education travesty. On one hand, you have the presence of health-threatening asbestos, which Franklin parents say the school district paid little attention until the privileged, in quotes, SLA students were to share the building space. And on the other hand, you have the unequal curriculum, access to technology, and other academic resources. The school district also assured the public that not only were the schools academically separate, that they would even have separate entrances. From my point of view, predictably, we can then expect different outcomes, Ray, higher education, employment, family sustaining wages, and the possibility of incarceration. Now, as we speak, the Franklin students are housed in a shuttered charter school in the heart of the Badlands, and the SLA students are housed at the school district headquarters and a Jewish synagogue. I believe we understand what the outcomes for children are who attend poor performing schools and live in deteriorating race-based neighborhoods. Crime and poverty in Philadelphia will continue to increase if we're not willing to course correct. More and more as so-called gentrification increases, blacks continue to be housed, affordable housing nomads and their children are undereducated and the problem of the urban poor will not change. Every day we see new high-priced, high-rise condos appearing in the city, but where's the housing for the non-wealthy and where's the opportunity for quality education for their children? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Warrington um, and the entire panel. Any questions from the committee to any of our panelists at this time? Okay. I have a question. Councilman Dom. I just want to try to understand the U.S. bank liens, I think it is. You said it's $41 million? No. The tax liens? Yeah, the tax liens. Six. Six. So the, um, uh, Councilman Dombs, and thank you for the question. So the, the issue is, re, regards um, uh, the so so many uh, homeowners in Philadelphia have these mortgages, FHA insured mortgages, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, there's a special rule for FHA insured mortgages that if you um, want to get it modified, and a lot of people who fall behind in their mortgages get it modified, capitalize the arrears, affordable monthly payment going forward. There's a special rule that applies to FHA insured mortgages that says that the modification has to be in first lien position. And because in Pennsylvania, the water and gas liens are super priority liens, then the, the HUD is saying that you cannot get an FHA insured mortgage a modification if you have a, a water and gas lien. Well, I'm referring to uh, the U.S. bank liens. Ah. Yeah, that's not public right. interest that's law center. Yeah, that's, that's okay. A public interest yeah. law center. But it was in the testimony of uh, yeah, public yeah. interest law center. I'm I'm, I'm yeah. pleased to be confused with um, with <laughs> public interest law center, but I with community legal services. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. I'll wait for them. Um, Ebony, I had a question for you. Um, you talked about. Uh, are you currently a renter or a homeowner? I'm a renter. You're a renter. Yes. Um, what what would you say if you had if you said to us outside of the more we know we need to build more housing unit what do you find to be one of your most per, more challenging issues with the programs we currently have in terms of you getting out of a rental to a, ownership although I would say Stacy who was a former president of WCRP <coughs> argued me into there's always going to be a rental community Maria as she reminded me she's like not everybody wants to be a homeowner but I want my children to be homeowners um, what would you say is is some of the biggest obstacles you're confronting 
like many people, I think that wages is an issue. Um, right now, luckily, I'm in a place where I do make a little more money than I have in the past, and so home ownership um, is a little bit more in reach for me than it had been, but I, f I feel like that's one of the biggest obstacles, and I do agree with Stacy that I guess people would consider me a millennial, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I think that um, the mindset towards home ownership has changed. I don't think that um, people move around a lot more. I think that um, the way the city is changing, it doesn't feel like a place that a lot of people want to be anymore. So there are many issues, but I say a chief among them is probably pay. Okay, okay, that's an important issue. Um, for for Michael, I know that the probate issue is one that I know you're, you've been talking to the incoming register of wills, and there's been some commitment to, to readdress this. As it relates to the PGW lien situation, has this been requested before to PUC, and who has said no in the past about um, the the lien situation, the lead positioning? Right. So it's a it's a rather complicated issue, mm -hmm. and so I've tried to distill it down to as basic as, mm -hmm. as simple, I guess, as, as possible. Um, it's within the city's. Um, it's within uh, PGW and the Water Department's authority to subordinate liens if they would like to do so. Um, we've been, Community Legal Services, on behalf of our home ownership clients, have um, been working um, with uh, the Law Department and with PGW and with um, the Water Department. Um, they uh, want FHA to change their rules. <laughs> FHA wants the mortgage servicers to change their rules. The mortgage servicers wants the city to change their rules. Um, and so, unfortunately, we have not yet been able to make much headway um, in um, finding a resolution to this. So what's the universe of people impacted by this, uh, would you say, annually, that at minimum, ten, the ones that go through your about system? About 10 a month. So about 120 10 a month? Annually. Yeah. So on the one hand, it's a small issue. On the other hand, for those 10 people a month, you're, they're, they're um, risking sheriff sale. Are, have there been any changes to the federal modification rules that we should be aware of under this administration versus the previous one? Um, that, sh that could further hamper people's ability? Not on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, fortunately and unfortunately, HUD moves at a glacial pace, and some of the... Um, some of the changes that went into place during the Obama administration we're still seeing now. Um, so for example, um, it's very important when we talk about intergenerational um, family homes that if uh, the borrower uh, dies before the mortgage is uh, paid off, that the heirs be allowed to assume that mortgage. Um, under the Obama administration, certain changes were put into place that would make it easier um, for heirs to um, to assume or take over excuse me, assume or take over their parent, their deceased parent's mortgage, um, we're finding it, uh, it's good that this new policy is in place, we're finding it, uh, it to be implemented very unevenly, and in the past we would have complained to the CFPB, the CFPB has not been as open to resolving these complaints as they had been in the Can past. Can you define who the C? Uh, the Consumer Financial Bureau. Protection Bureau, which um, has jurisdiction over a lot of financial services, including um, uh, mortgage lenders and mortgage servicers. Are there particular lenders that you find are more difficult in the participation? Come on, we got to call them out. Um, <laughs> there, there are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there are. I, I'm, I'm, I, yeah, <laughs> but we, but we can like I, I think it would it would it would harm our clients our efforts to our help our clients by sort of naming them in a public forum because we continue to try to negotiate with them to try to save our clients' homes. Ms. Warrington just gave us a history know, lesson around redlining, the GI Bill, access to home ownership, and part of the debate is right. always the banks. Who holds them accountable? <clears throat> I've had the pleasure of being part of CRA disputes in my previous life, right? I feel like we need to go back to some of that right, discussion right. Um, as you see the consolidation of the, of the banking world. But, you know, we have a lot of banking partners in the city of Philadelphia, and we should know, right, in a very formal way, because, you know, to the one hand, we invest in all of you to help us fight with people that are in our backyard, and we should know that, right? And so I'm not going to put you on the spot publicly here, but if there are particular institutions, any institutions that the city's doing business with, we should know that. Uh, I'd be happy to follow up with you and, and call Thank you very much.
Any other questions from our panelists? Uh, oh. Real briefly, um, uh, Andy Frischkopf for Michael. Um, so also you, you mentioned the probate issue, and generally, similar to the councilwoman's question, um, roughly how many do you think in a month or a year sort of are going through probate or would, would except for the fees? Good basically. question. Um, so we know that uh, the last time I looked at the Register of Wills um, probated uh, 6,000 um, estates per year. And so uh, I don't know how many of them are low income. Um, what I can say, though, is that in our experience, this would not be money which is not which is currently being paid, which would if if there was a policy to waive those fees would not be um, wa would not be paid. Instead, um, what many of our clients do is they go down to the register of wills with the intent to probate their loved one's estate. They learn that it costs several hundred dollars that they don't have. They then turn around and go home, and they never complete the process. So uh, a policy like this would um, certainly increase the workload on the Register of Wills, but I don't think, and so, and of course there's a cost in hiring additional staff, et cetera, but I don't predict that it would be, would cost, would, would reduce the amount of revenue that the Register of Wills brings in. Do, is that a county rule for the state or is it a city rule? Um, I, it, would, it would be, I think that the city could waive the probate fees. Um, the, in the past, the register has raised questions about the uh, authority that it had. Um, however, I believe that the, that, um, that the, the city does have that, that authority. Was, has there ever been a legal opinion to no, that effect? No, there has not. Okay. Work to do. Yeah. Thank you. One more question, Councilman Ball. Thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony. So, so um, this is just on a big picture, and I'm a supporter of home ownership. Let me just put that out there. But um, I've lived through three recessions, 1980 to 82. Interest rates were 19 and 20 percent. In the 90s, I don't remember the year, I'd block it out. And then again in 2008 to 2010. And I will say this, in those instances, we would ask the owners, how much cash do you have to sell, not the buyer? because they were underwater. And what happened in 2008 and 2011, we had a tremendous amount of inventory that was underwater. I think 2004, 2005 was the peak of home ownership in the country at about 69% or so. Then it's today about 64. I think Philadelphia is between that 48 to 50%, but of the top 20 cities, we're still pretty high up for home ownership. And most cities won't see big home ownership because it's, they're transient by nature. But by the same token, <clears throat> I'm 100% in favor of having people build wealth through owning their own homes. But I will say that even on the higher end of the market, what's going on right now, people aren't buying because the federal government has changed the rules. There's a $10,000 limitation on real estate taxes and a $750,000 mortgage limitation. So those people who used to buy stopped. They're renting. So there's, there's a lot of things going on that are changing. I'm just mentioning that to give you an over, overview. But thank you for your testimony today. Of course, Ebony. Thank you. So as I thought about it, another thing that I think is a barrier um, in your remark, uh, Councilman Don made me think about it, recessions, right? Um, and I think that has contributed to the mindset about home ownership tremendously. Um, and when I think about community land trust, which is a tool to ensure permanent affordability, I think I believe that if we had more community land trust, a lot of people would feel more comfortable owning homes because you have that community to support you should anything go wrong. Um, regardless of how the market changes, you're, you're protected. And I think that people a lot of times can't always predict, predict what their income is going to be like. They may not have savings. They may not have money to uh, preserve their homes. But with a program like that, you do have a safety net. So... Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much for your testimony this, this evening. Um, I'm going to call up our next panel, Jamal Henderson from ACT UP, Carrie Rothman from Habitat for, Habitat for Humanity, Jenny Greenberg from the Neighborhood Gardens Trust. If any of you have written testimony that you can share with the panel, because some of you I did not get. After that, I have um, James Carter, and I think Andy, both of you are testifying together, Susan McFeardron, and um, 
Rouge Brochette. <coughs> Jamal here, Henderson. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today <clears throat> and for Council's interest in the focus on reducing poverty in Philadelphia. My name is Carrie Rathman. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Habitat for Humanity Philadelphia, where we build strength, stability, and self-reliance through affordable housing. We do this through building and stabilizing affordable home ownership. So for our new home ownership, uh, Habitat builds new or rehabs homes to sell to hardworking families making between 30 and 60% of area median income. Oftentimes, these are families working two or more jobs or individuals working two or more jobs within the household. We provide an affordable mortgage product where households monthly payments, including mortgage, current tax, and insurance do not exceed 30% of their monthly household income. To date, we have built and sold 218 homes to individuals and families who would not have otherwise been able to purchase homes. We also carry out stabilization repair projects for existing homeowners with household incomes up to 80% of area median income. We've completed nearly 530 across the city to date, bringing the benefits of safe, stable homeownership to uh, more than 1,300 Philadelphians. We have all seen how homeownership can be a vehicle to building family and generational wealth. History has shown us that keeping homeownership out of reach or systematically stripping black families of their homeownership has been a major factor in creating the widespread and entrenched poverty we see in Philadelphia today. Redlining, predatory lending, and denied access to credit that erodes, the, that erodes or blocks homeownership has been widely successful in creating a racial wealth gap and elevating poverty across the country and here in Philadelphia. Certainly, wages, education, and other bias systems have played a role in creating our persistent poverty level, but we believe that homeownership development programs can play a valuable tool to build family wealth and neighborhood stability in Philadelphia, especially at a time when our strengthening housing market is boosting equity in most neighborhoods. And I do admit that this is a longer game. Thoughtful approaches to increasing homeownership for Philadelphia's low-income uh, lower economic residents could be foundational to preventing households from slipping into poverty. Homeownership would also help inoculate future generations of those families from doing so as well. Homeownership creates a physical asset for families, most, for most of us, it's our largest financial asset, that provides leverageable equity during hardship. Homeownership provides a stable place to live where families are more protective from the fluctuating market forces and thus increasing rents. Homeownership mitigates the impact of generational poverty by creating an asset that family, member, mem, family members in poverty can inherit. Homeownership can also be a critical community development strategy, providing the stability of long-term residents with, long, with large financial investments in their neighborhood. Critical mass of homeowners creates the basis for any neighborhood social fabric, converting vacant lots and structures into affordable homes for, sa for sale helps revitalize entire blocks and communities. And this improves conditions for owners and renters alike, and all Philadelphians at large. So we know that home ownership is only, an appro is only appropriate for a specific segment of the city's low-income renters. The households we assist are just a smidge, and that's the technical term, over the poverty line for a family of four. The differential currently is only $1,300 annually. Most renters live below the poverty line would need additional income and likely reduction of bad debt to be considered for our homeownership program. These renters would require other supports, um, many of which have been described earlier, prior to any homeownership program or services. But increasing homeownership opportunities for these thousands of families on the cusp, those with appropriate incomes but still struggling in the gentle, general rental market would go a long way to keeping these families from dipping in and out of poverty, as many families do. Philadelphia's high cost of construction keeps traditional market rate developers from building new, and, new low, and moderate income homeownership. Sale prices are not adequate to cover the high cost of construction. Public subsidy is needed to fill the gap between construction cost and sale price just to break even. Philadelphia used to fund affordable homeownership development, but has eliminated the bulk of programs due to federal budget cuts and the restrictions attached to federal funding sources. The challenges of low, 
lower income buyers ability to secure mortgages from traditional lenders has created barriers to selling these properties once developed, but Habitat faces none of these challenges. We hold our own mortgage, we have a guaranteed purchaser and alternates well before our property is complete. So nothing ever sits vacant. We know increasing homeownership requires a much longer view to reducing poverty, but we also know that this investment in homeowners is sound. To reduce poverty and increase low income and increase low income homeownership in Philadelphia, we suggest the following. Think about targeting households from 50 to 60 percent of area median income, that's about 45,000 to 54 for annually for a family, family of four or up to 80 percent AMI. Provide local per unit subsidy with a cap of 100,000 so, so the purchase price can be written down to around 150,000 for sale to these families. Additional subsidy or um, substitution of these subsidies might be found on the private market through Federal Home Loan Bank, PHFA, or other philanthropic sources. Amortize any city subsidy over a 15 year period, period to incentivize owner longevity but allow for equity growth for family wealth building. Use the land bank more efficiently and effectively to acquire, assemble, and dispose of land at nominal value for affordable housing. We urge you also to revisit um, the operational requirements right now of showing full financing for a project before any affordable houser gets to take ownership of it. We also encourage you to get full data regarding the potential inventory of vacant structures that can be targeted for rehab into homeownership. Furthermore, don't disincentivize non- and for-profit developer partnerships. Consider allowing nonprofits to directly acquire their portion of a property, allowing us to realize the full benefit of our nonprofit status and decreasing costs. Nonprofit entity entities acting alone have benefits on transfer taxes and other funding sources when they are not tied to for-profit developers, and we lose those sometimes in, um, in partnerships. We believe that this is already within the city's discretionary powers. Consider um, allowing home funds for homeownership creation, as has been allowable in the past, but has stopped in recent years. Evaluate zoning changes that would increase density to cut costs. Allow developers to build smaller footprint homes, maximize units per lots, and meet the needs of low to moderate income buyers. Investigate the city-driven cost drivers, including stormwater management and street paving requirements that add considerable cost but cannot be recovered through sale price. Consider the use of city capital funds for infrastructure and affordable housing discounts for stormwater fees. Consider ways other ways that the city can help reduce the high construction costs of Philadelphia. Um, and in terms of preserving affordable homeownership, we urge you all to consider creating clear guidelines and tracking systems for OPA assessments of subsidized homeownership properties that have a second soft mortgage that limit the resale price. This would ensure property owners are not priced out based on rising tax taxes during and after any tax abatements or affordability expiration, expirations. Currently, homes with soft seconds are often assessed at values that those families can't actually extract from the market. This is a huge issue for our homeowners, especially in North and South Philadelphia, who are finding that overnight, their combined mortgage and tax payments will double what was originally anticipated. And finally, please continue to fund critical repair and stabilization for existing homeowners living at or um, above the poverty rate, but below 80% of AMI. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask Ebony Griffin from the Public Interest Law Center, which was the question that Councilman Don, I'm going to ask her to come and join the panel since our other guest was not here. You want to continue? Thank you. Then we'll ask questions of the entire panel. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Jenny Greenberg, <clears throat> and I serve as the executive director of the Neighborhood Gardens Trust. I'm here to offer testimony on the negative impact that the U.S. bank lien situation is having on community gardens that serve low-income households across the city of Philadelphia. NGT is Philadelphia's neighborhood garden protector. It's our mission to acquire and preserve community gardens and shared open spaces to enhance quality of life in Philadelphia's neighborhoods. 
There are upwards of 400 community gardens in Philadelphia, which have been cultivated in historically disinvested neighborhoods on abandoned land through the cooperative efforts of neighborhood residents. These gardens have become essential community assets that provide healthy green space and a source of fresh, affordable produce. Often community gardeners steward land that is owned by the city and a number of private tax delinquent owners. These gardens are at risk because the gardeners do not have secure land tenure for the precious spaces on which they cultivate food flowers and community. The need to proactively secure and protect vital community managed open spaces is pressing. Increases in real estate development, land values, and speculation are putting these uh, decades old gardens in jeopardy. NGT works to secure ownership or long-term leases for these gardens so they can be protected for community access long-term. We've worked intensively with gardeners and community groups in the city to protect 48 open spaces across the city to date, and we're working to actively protect 70 gardens by 2022. Often gardens comprise multiple parcels of land with different owners. We've been working closely with the city's land holding agencies to assemble land to protect the full garden footprint. In the past two years, we've been able to acquire 28 parcels of land at 11 community gardens through nominal sale disposition from the city. And we're working with the land bank to acquire privately owned tax delinquent parcels. Multiple gardens, however, have tax delinquent parcels that no, not only have liens due to the city, but also third-party liens, which are a result of a tax lien securitization deal that the city did in 1997. These liens, which we refer to as U.S. bank liens, I understand are actually now owned to MBIA, which is this, the Municipal Bond Insurance Association. Because of these liens, we're losing garden properties to sheriff sale or through private sales entered into by speculators. These liens are like a flag to real estate speculators of opportunities to buy properties cheap and flip them to developers. This is how we lost half of the 20-year-old vibrant food-producing St. Bernard Community Garden in West Philadelphia to a new house last year. And this is why we now have to fundraise $80,000 to purchase a lot at the Emerald Street Community Farm in Kensington. The land bank had acquired two other tax delinquent parcels at this garden for protection, but was prevented from acquiring the last one because of a U.S. bank lien. These liens are in first lien holder position, so the uh, land bank cannot move forward with acquisition of these parcels until the U.S. bank liens are resolved. A developer has purchased the last parcel right smack in the middle of the garden, and we're fortunate that he's willing to wait, but what a waste of time to have to raise money to buy it back now. Since the system, um, a system-wide solution seemed far off, in 2018, NGT tried to take matters into our own hands to resolve this issue by submitting a proposal to U.S. Bank, asking them to assign us their liens on 10 properties within at-risk gardens for nominal consideration in order to further our preservation efforts. The proposal was that they do so as a charitable donation. After extensive research, we were unable to get a contact directly at the bank and were directed to submit the proposal through Line Barger, who said they would pass it along to their client for consideration. At first, Line Barger said they would have an answer to us within a month. Ultimately, they never got back to us with an answer and stopped responding to my emails. With this in mind, I want to tell you about one more garden, the Five Lobes Two Fish Garden, a community-based project uh, to promote wellness and eliminate information disparities about health and nutrition in Hestonville, an extremely low-income and food-insecure section of West Philadelphia. The garden has a partnership with a local school and provides educational programming to elementary students. There are 29 raised beds for growing produce and flowers. In May 2018, NGT acquired two of the garden's parcels from the city. Subsequently, the land bank acquired three additional tax delinquent parcels with the intention to transfer them to us for protection. The last lot, which is right in the middle of the garden, has more than $16,000 due in U.S. bank liens with all the fees, interests, and penalties, and an additional $8,000 owed to the city. I dread the day we learn that it, too, has been purchased. We need the U.S. bank lien properties to stop being sold at sheriff sale until the situation is resolved. We also need a pathway for liens on high-priority parcels for charitable purposes like affordable housing 
and community gardens to be resolved quickly so that we can secure them before it's too late. A few potential solutions include securing a charitable donation of US bank liens to nonprofits for specific properties that are critical to affordable housing and community garden projects. Under this scenario, the lien holder could assign its lien right to NGT or a similar nonprofit and treat that assignment as a charitable donation. The nonprofit could then protect the parcel from being sold off at sheriff's sale, and ultimately the nonprofit could cancel the lien at the time the nonprofit obtains title to the parcel. Short of securing a donation, the city needs to get an agreement with Linebarger to accept principal only payments and to waive years of penalties, fees, and interest charges. We need a revision to the city's acquisition policy to allow the land bank to pay off U.S. bank liens so that they can proceed with their acquisition process, and they need the funds to do so. And the city needs to develop a clear process by which U.S. bank liens can be paid off after or just prior to finalizing land bank acquisition of our property, whereby we avoid the risk of paying off a U.S. bank lien and then losing the property to a developer anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Then I'll let Ebony in then. Hello. Thank you for allowing me to join the panel. Um, my name is Ebony Griffin. Um, I am a staff attorney at the Public Interest Law Center focusing on environmental justice and the Law Center's Garden Justice Legal Initiative. Thank you for allowing me to testify today about an issue which very deeply affects my practice and the preservation of green space in communities of color and low-income neighborhoods in Philadelphia. The Law Center commends you for convening this hearing to find meaningful solutions to the problem at hand. In our environmental work, the Law Center uses a variety of methods to ensure that Philadelphia's most vulnerable residents have access to a healthy, natural, and built environment, but also that they have a seat at the table and a voice in what happens in their neighborhoods. The Garden Justice Legal Initiative accomplishes this by providing pro bono legal representation to urban farmers and community gardens in Philadelphia in efforts to protect and preserve the city's green space, which is being lost due to development pressure. This development pressure in part stems from the 1997 securitization of tax liens. The 1997 tax lien securitization and remaining U.S. bank liens contribute to gentrification, displacement, urban blight, and a reduction in green space. This testimony explains how and also provides potential solutions to the problem. So research in our own experience demonstrates that cleaning and greening vacant lots across Philadelphia results <coughs> in significant reductions to both perceived risk to safety and actual violent crimes in neighborhoods, including gun violence. Further, thousands of uh, these lots have the potential to be repurposed as food producing gardens and green spaces, improving the quality of life in low income neighborhoods while simultaneously mitigating the impacts of climate change by reducing the surface temperature, creating a cooling effect in areas dense, densely packed with concrete, and reducing mortality rates among vulnerable populations during heat waves. As cli <coughs> climate change increases, the planet warms and sea levels rise. This results in hotter overall temperatures and more severe weather events such as flooding. In urban areas, minor increases in surface temperature can be deadly. In 1997, the city bundled together 30,000 tax liens and sold them to U.S. Bank, a private corporation, in order to raise revenue to address a school funding crisis. The city lost money in this effort when investors were unable to collect on many of the securitized liens. The Philadelphia Department of Revenue in November, in a, sorry, November 2013 report described the results of the 1997 as the worst case scenario for a tax lien securitization. We have heard from neighborhood redevelopers across the city that properties whose liens were sold remained in limbo for years, unavailable for redevelopment because tax balances continued to be uncollectible. Public agencies could not acquire the property without first paying the lien holder the value of the lien plus their fees, which stymied efforts to get vacant tax delinquent properties back into productive use. In fact, then Chief of, Chief of Staff to Mayor Rendell acknowledged the city's miscalculation regarding the uncollectible amounts in a quote that appeared in a 2001 Philadelphia Inquirer editorial. Quote, the, the, the rating agencies missed it, the underwriters missed it, the insurer missed it, and the city missed it, end quote. The consequences of the fallout from the 1997 securitization are still evident today. 
While the exact number is unclear, data from the city estimates that between 3,600 and 5,500 properties in Philadelphia are encumbered by U.S. bank liens. The liens on these properties are between 18 to 20 million, with a total debt to the city of 41 million. Um, and to clarify, the actual principal balance on the liens is the eight, between 18 and 20 million, and the total 41 million includes all the penalties and interests that have accrued since then. So approximately half of the potential clients who reach out to the Law Center for help in preserving a garden manage lots burdened by a U.S. bank lien. The problems associated with the U.S. bank lien uh, on a garden parcel manifest in a number of ways. The Law Center regularly receives requests from, for help from gardeners threatened with losing parcels to sheriff cell. In the absence of a U.S. bank lien, removing a parcel from the sheriff cell necessitates share cell list necessitates a phone call to the appropriate council person's office and a subsequent conversation with the Philadelphia Land Bank about acquisition of the parcel and eventual disposition to the gardener. However, more often than not, we learned that the parcels were part of the large-scale securitization of 1997. In these instances, even with council support, there is little that can be done to save the garden as growers are often unable to pay the lien and the exorbitant fees that accompany it. This usually leads to a developer purchasing the property and replacing the garden with luxury housing units out of the reach of the existing community. This dynamic ultimately contributes to a sharp increase in property taxes and displacement of long-term lower-income residents. One such, one, such, sorry, one such garden was lost to a, to a developer because of a U.S. bank lien. The garden had been tended by an elderly resident who used the produce from the garden to feed himself. He had previously reached out to the city inquiring about a title transfer. However, the presence of the U.S. bank lien made this impossible. Eventually, a developer purchased the garden at sheriff's sale and pl plans to replace it with a luxury condominium. U.S. bank liens even make it difficult for low-income gardeners to use the law as a means to preserve their gardens. Because of the increase in gardens being lost to sheriff's sale, the law center developed a training program to teach other attorneys throughout the city how to represent gardens. Since April 2018, we have held six of these training programs, with one more scheduled for this year, December 5th to be exact, and we have recruited over 100 attorneys interested in assisting with our mission. However, often large law firms represented, represented on our list of volunteers have conflicts of interest and cannot represent clients on parcels with U.S. bank liens. A, another garden was nearly lost at sheriff's sale after U.S. bank attempted to collect on its lien. The parcel was home to a community memorial garden, far, formed after a gas explosion destroyed four houses and killed at least two people in 1973. The sheriff's sale process was postponed. However, the land bank was unable to acquire the par parcel for disposition to the gardeners due to the U.S. bank lien. Moreover, the U.S. bank lien made it impossible for the garden to secure legal counsel. Ultimately, unable to reach an agreement with U.S. bank, the gardeners resorted to a crowdfunding campaign in order to clear the lien and obtain an attorney. The presence of U.S. bank land significantly impairs the ability of the land bank to put vacant land back into productive reuse. As such, long abandoned parcels remain overgrown, littered with trash, drug paraphernalia, and other debris. Abandoned tax delinquent properties create a vicious cycle of blight in urban areas throughout the Commonwealth. With approximately 43,000 vacant lots, the problem is particularly acute in Philadelphia. The majority of vacant land in Philadelphia is clustered in council districts 3, 5, and 7. These districts also have the highest poverty rates in the city on average. Over 300,000 Philadelphians live on blocks with one or more abandoned houses or parcels. This large inventory of vacant land not only decreases the value of neighboring, neighboring properties, but burdens residents and local government as vacant properties create significant health and safety issues. So solutions. To mitigate the inevitable and continued gentrification, displacement, and loss of green space facilitated by the presence of U.S. bank liens, the city must develop a short-term and long-term strategy. As the first step of the short-term pol policy or strategy, the city must place a moratorium on sending garden parcels to sheriff's sale until it can ensure that it has the ability to acquire those parcels if the U.S. bank liens are present. This will prevent the gardens from being lost to developers while the city develops a longer-term solution. Secondly, we encourage the city to pass legislation author authorizing the land bank to acquire parcels with U.S. bank liens, re-empowering them to work towards putting vacant, blighted properties back into productive reuse. Finally, for gardens, to be a for gardens able to pay a portion of the U.S. bank liens, the city must negotiate an easily navigable, accessible system that eliminates penalties and allows individuals to enter into payment arrangements for the principal balance. 
For the long-term sal- strategy, the city must allocate funds to pay off the U.S. bank liens in their entirety. The estimated total cost to the city to pay off the U.S. bank lien balance is $41 million. However, the city could likely negotiate a reduction in penalties with the lien holder. Additionally, while the exact amount of U.S. bank liens on garden parcels is not yet available, the amount would sig- be significantly less. And I added a footnote um, that sort of explains that the city is undergoing uh, urban agriculture strategic planning process, so that data should be available in the very near future. Finally, the city must commit to developing an equitable property tax collection system that does not include securitizing land containing community green space or real property that threatens Philadelphia's most vulnerable residents. The Law Center looks forward to continuing the conversation around eliminating U.S. bank liens on the city's vacant land. We are happy to engage and work through solutions, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Dom had a question very early on, so I'll let him... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I, I just want to try to understand the U.S. bank liens. Or you're saying in your testimony that um, the liens on the properties are 18 to 20 million. Are those the liens from the city? Those are the liens. Yes, the, the liens that were securitized and that are the principal balances that are owned by U.S. Bank, or it's not U.S. Bank anymore, but that are owned and would be owed, the principal balances are between 18 and $20 million. So those are mostly, I assume, real estate taxes? Right. And then the penalties and interest take it up to $41 million? Yes. I just want to make sure I understand the numbers. Yes. And do we have any idea how many of those properties are, as you say, or it's 5,000 roughly properties. How many of those are actually gardens? Do you know? There are 400 gardens in the city. Not all of them um, have U.S. bank liens on them, obviously. And again, we're working through the Urban Act strategic process that'll sort of explain exactly how many parcels there are, but we don't really know right now. So do we have any idea what the market value is of that, of those parcels, those 5,000 parcels? No, we don't know that one. Because we could look that up through, I guess, OPA, which is the only, it's not accurate, of course, but it's the only <laughs> source we have just to figure that out. What I'm thinking of is, does it make sense for the city to try to wipe out these liens, pay the negotiation of whatever it is, maybe it's not 18 or 20, maybe it's 25, but not 41, and then provide the community gardens and then figure out how to, through the land bank, sell the balance of the inventory to pay for the whole purchase? I think that makes sense, especially considering the impact that um, this loss is having on low-income communities and communities of color. And also, I didn't really mention, but this the this inability to really acquire parcels that have U.S. bank liens on it has a huge impact on affordable housing as well because it prohibits the land bank from being able to acquire those parcels and then um, sort of broker the affordable housing deals. Right. I mean, we've been hearing about these for a while, so I think the city's going to have to take the step to negotiate this and take them over and then figure out how we have provide gardens and then how do we get the market value back from the rest of the properties. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I do have another question. <laughs> On the Habitat for Humanity, mm-hmm. what is the cost? I took a tour, by the way, at one of your homes, and mm-hmm. I did, you guys did a great job, by the way. And that time it was like 200000 Is that still the cost to build? Well, where'd you tour? <laughs> did you tour at Oxford Green? I did. And so, um, and before I want to say that we are the banker, the caseworker, the developer, the construction, and so we are everything. Um, so our current all-in cost is three forty, but sticks and bricks is much lower than that, and that includes you know we have to also redevelop the street and stormwater management. So there's a lot in there. But I would argue all of those different um, companies in, in the market ecosystem would be more expensive than... And you're providing the financing for mm-hmm. home? What yeah. is the interest rate on that financing today? Right Today it's 0%. That's so pretty good. But um, I will say in perpetuity, we've changed our language to be an affordable mortgage product so that payments will always stay the same, but maybe we will subsidize more so that a bank will buy... Uh, a bank will originate the mortgage because you can't build new houses with hugs and high fives. So you're providing... <laughs> which is what we get now. Just make sure I understand. You're giving zero interest rate loans. So all they're paying is principal. Correct. Yes. And if you were to uh, put an interest rate on it and subsidize it, you could then package that debt and sell it. 
Correct. We currently do leverage debt after the fact, but we could have we could have banks originate it so that we could have uh, cash at closing. So would it be cheaper for you to go to a bank, have them originate it, and you buy it down? Uh, and us buy it down? Oh, that's a good. We haven't <coughs> thought about it, but we don't have the capital to buy it down. But you have the capital to lend. Instead of lending the loan, you could do a buy down of the loan or the interest rate. Yeah, but that mortgages. I, I had to think about that. We, we haven't do that. thought about it the other way. Around, so that's the tool we used in 1981 huh? when really? rates were 20%. Because you have to understand, 19, the home you buy today for 200000 has the same payment as the home back. I'm sorry, the home you buy today for 900000 has the same payment that 1981 was 200000 mm -hmm. because of interest rates. So the power of interest rates, maybe you could maneuver to get that rate down and then free up your money. We would also, our folks do not get mortgages on the private market. They are not attractive to a private market. They are 